electronic typewriters, smart machines that double as computer printers. That sounds really cool, and I want to check that out for myself. I've actually been trying to do this for about a year now. I thought the EP20 I got a while back would be able to be modified to include a parallel port, but no, that was only available on the EP22. And I've been trying to find a wheel writer with the printer option installed, but those are apparently very uncommon, and I bet that was because they were really expensive. But I recently found this, and as you might be able to guess from that article from 1985, it is going to work. This is a Smith Corona Ultrasonic 350 Messenger. It is an electronic typewriter and somewhat of a word processor. It was released in 1984, which means it would have competed directly with IBM's Wheelwriter. Now you might be wondering, what's so special about the Ultrasonic 350? It's mostly just a regular typewriter. It uses a daisy wheel for the characters, which was quite common by the 80s. There isn't anything particularly special about the electronically controlled keyboard, and being a later model word processor, it's not really all that appealing to most typewriter collectors. And all those points are exactly what I was thinking when I first saw this in a thrift store, that is, until I spied this switch. Keyboard on, off? Why would you ever want to turn off the keyboard on a typewriter? Is that really what it does? Well, let's load in a sheet of paper and see for ourselves. If, with the keyboard switches in the on position, we can type like normal. Oh, I apparently have underline on and bumped caps lock. But that's exactly what you'd expect. Where I, 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 I touched a lot of buttons on here. Let me go ahead and power it off and on. But if you turn the keyboard switch into the off position, it really does turn off the keyboard. Now, thankfully, this typewriter was kept in pretty fantastic shape, and I'll bet part of that was due to the case it was kept in, because that meant that the manual was still with it. If the manual hadn't been there, I might have walked past this and kept going, even with the keyboard switch. But with the manual, I was able to see this. The messenger module printer option. So disabling the keyboard on a typewriter makes a lot more sense if you're using it as a printer. But how exactly does this work? Well, we can see that it says it can communicate over RS-232 serial. And if we look on the back, we will see a DB9 port. Hmm, that sounds pretty interesting, doesn't it? Well, it isn't. This is a very proprietary port. If you tried to plug this into a serial port, you'd have a bad day. So unfortunately, just like the wheel rider, this typewriter is capable of being computer controlled. It's just that you must have an external module connected to it to have the proper interface. However, unlike a wheel rider where the interface module is so incredibly rare that very few of them have ever been found or documented, the Smith Corona Ultrasonic 3 module is actually fairly easy to get. At least at the time that I was looking for one, there were two options available for me on eBay, and I had to jump on it. Now, before we get to the meat and potatoes of this with the messenger module, I do want to go over a couple features on the typewriter that make it cool on its own. If we do the messenger module first, there's no way this thing could compete with that for interest. So we're going to get back to this in just a few more minutes. Now, to give you an idea of how cool some of the features are on this thing, I'm going to compare it to its contemporary, the IBM Wheelwriter 3. Now, this actually isn't the same uh, Wheelwriter that I bolt modded. This one works out of the gate. Um, the rivets on here are fine. Uh, I just picked this one up sort of recently and figure I'm going to run it through its paces now. The other one has a broken lever back here, so this one still has it. One of these days, I'm going to uh, maybe do a stream where I take this apart, measure this out, and 3D print a new one of these for the other one. But for now, this one uh, works, and I kind of need this to work <laughs> to show off this very first thing. All right, so the first thing I want to show you here is that the entirety of the Wheel Rider series does not let you manually control the platen. This is a feature that mostly died off with the electronic and uh, word processing capable typewriters. So it's really cool to see that on here. In addition to 
having the dial for control, you can also change how many lines the platen control moves. One, two, or infinite. Oh, I thought that was, oh, well, there we go, infinite. So it's really nice to be able to have that feature, and it's a shame that these don't. Now, the platen controls of this get even better. So let's start out by looking at how you load paper. So on the Wheel Rider 3 here, the first step you need to do is release the platen lock. So this will allow the paper to move freely around the platen. Then you need to pull forward the page holder. Then you can slide the paper in, push paper down, after you lock that, that is, and it will, whoops, you want paper up. And then the paper will be fed into the position. You cannot just roll the platen manually to get the paper in there, which is what I did earlier with the ultrasonic here. But that's not how you have to do it. If you slide the sheet of paper in here and let it rest, you can just pull the guide rail forward and pull it forward some more, and it will bring the paper into position for you with the one control. That's pretty sweet. I had to type a little bit here to get the ribbon on the wheel rider into a fresh spot, but let's take a look at one of the features that has to do with correcting. Now, both of these are correcting typewriters, which isn't surprising, having been released in the 80s. Correcting typewriters had been around for decades at this point. But the ultrasonic has a feature that puts it a step above the wheel rider. So let's say you're typing and you make a mistake. Now, how are you going to correct this? Well, you can hit the correction key. The correcting ribbon isn't doing particularly well on here, but you can see how you have to hit the key once to go back each character, and then you can retype. Now, how would you do this on the ultrasonic? Well, the ultrasonic has the word eraser TM key right there, and I bet you can guess what that does. Pretty sweet, huh? Both of these typewriters will also alert you with an audible beep as you approach the edge of the right margin. However, the ultrasonic has another feature. If we back up a little bit and start typing, you can see it automatically went back to the beginning of the page. The ultrasonic has enhanced typewriter features that can be enabled or disabled along the top row of the numbers using the code key. So to do auto return, I had just enabled auto return up here. I can disable it as well if I want and use an assortment of other very useful features such as the ability to tab a table in or center the typing carriage. There's a lot of cool features here. The wheel rider has none of those. Now I could continue to demonstrate interesting features that the ultrasonic has that the wheel rider does not, but that's not what we're really looking at here. I just wanted to illustrate how really good this thing is. But for now, I think it's time we move back on to the main event, using this typewriter as a printer. One final comparison for completeness though, the ultrasonic does have the fairly typical nine pin port down there, which just allows you to connect an external module to use as a printer interface. The wheel rider, though, has this flap up here with a header buried down in there that isn't the easiest thing to get to. And the only instances that I've been able to find of a printer module attached on here say that it's a gigantic piece of equipment that sticks onto the back here and needs its own power supply and has all you gotta snap out some of these fins. It's, it's not as elegant as this. I think that this was a much better solution and, well, that might be why these are more common. The Wheel Rider one is probably very expensive, well, would have been very expensive, and difficult to install. So, yeah, that would explain why there are more of these ones available. Now, before we get this thing connected and start using it, I want to take a little bit of a direct look at it, because there are some interesting, confusing things about this. So, while it seems simple, you have the connection to the typewriter and a connection to a computer that provides a standard Sendtronics interface or a large format serial connection, there's more to it than just that. Now, 
We're going to get this open and take a look at the inside, but just one little interesting thing on the outside, that font. Hmm, does it seem kind of familiar to you? Because it seems kind of familiar to me. Opening the messenger module is fairly easy. There are two screws on the rear that hold in this little bracket on the back. And once you can feed that off the cable, you're able to pull out the insides. Now, why would you ever want to open your messenger module? These dip switches. If you ever have any intention of using this over serial, you're going to need to use these dip switches. Now, I didn't get this with the manual, and I missed getting a complete boxed example by two days. So, I would have never known how to use these dip switches if it wasn't for Incentricity, who has a page about a Smith Corona Memory Correct 400 messenger, and he was able to track down what these dip switches are for and some character codes you can send over the serial port to change different settings. A big shout out to Incentricity because without that page, I wouldn't even be able to make this video and I would have assumed that either the typewriter or the messenger module were broken. And we'll get to that when we first start to use this on a computer. All right, it's finally time to check out the messenger module and use the Ultrasonic 350 as a printer. It does plug in very easily. It must be missing at least one screw. There is a screw on the other side, but that's not really that big of a deal. Although this is somewhat loose, so you might want to actually screw it in there if you were going to set this up, you know, 30 years ago. And speaking of when you would have used this, I don't think there's any better computer to demo it with than an IBM 5150. Okay, I'm going to be connecting the messenger module over the parallel port on my 5150. It is possible to use the serial port, but the parallel port is better supported by most applications. Once you have it connected to the correct connector on the back of the 5150 and on the messenger module itself, it should work without any further configuration. The dip switches inside of the messenger module do have some settings that can be affected for the parallel port interface. Most of the ones you'll need to worry about will change the serial port, but it should work no matter what the settings are based on what the dip switches do. It may just not work quite as expected. Now, on my computer here, I'm going to do a small amount of troubleshooting because I have two parallel ports on here because I still have the MDA card in here from when I did dual monitors on my 5150. Okay, here I have the 5150 up and running with the typewriter connected to it over the messenger module. I've loaded Mr. Ed, and since I mentioned the dual monitor video, I went ahead and loaded my assembly code for demonstrating that. Now, I'm going to go ahead and turn on the printer, well, typewriter, and see if I can print the code through the typewriter. All right, so I'm going to go to File, Print. I'm going to print over LPT2, because I believe that's the one that the uh, Techmar Captain card, that I also did a video on, uh, is. So let's go ahead and try this. Hmm, that doesn't seem very promising. And you might think that it's broken. Something's not working. But there is one further secret with the messenger module. And it's not even the messenger module's fault. It's the typewriter's. It's actually fully functional right now. We haven't set it to messenger module mode, though. And you might think, oh, just turn off the keyboard. Nope, that's not it. Printer not ready. It's still going to fail. There is one further thing that you have to do to get this to work. Code P. Once you've hit code P, then it will work as a printer. So let's go ahead and try this again. I've gone ahead and canceled it because I don't have a ton of ribbon left on there, and there was a slight problem, but we saw that it worked. Let me grab the sheet of paper there so you can see what the problem is. Now, the text that it printed is crystal clear, but it's missing the left two characters. The margins are ignored when you use this as a printer, so you want to make sure that you have the paper aligned correctly in the typewriter so that you don't accidentally do this.
All right, now that I've got a new sheet of paper in there, adjusted all the way to the left, I'm gonna go ahead and reprint the code close up so you can see what it looks like. Oops, it ran out. Paper just wasn't long enough. But you can see, it's pretty good looking. Now the typewriter running out of paper is entirely my fault. Any computer application like this would be assuming you'd be using computer paper. It's a very different kind of paper than regular letter paper because it is continuous. This is a type of paper that will come out in one long sheet, usually with tractor leads on the sides, like for the 5152 printer for the 5150. Matter of fact, I want to show you something about that because there's a pretty good question about this typewriter in this setup that I think is worth answering. Why in 1984 would you choose to buy a typewriter over a printer? Printers like the aforementioned IBM 5152 were readily available, so what advantages could the typewriter offer over a printer? Well, the typewriter obviously has a keyboard, so it can be used independent of a computer. While useful, this feature obviously wasn't strong enough to keep typewriters around on their own, so being a printer with a keyboard isn't the saving grace. Though in the article I showed in the intro, the author did enjoy the standalone nature of it being a typewriter, but that will be a personal preference. The printer makes up for lacking a keyboard anyway, because missing that and other direct controls allows it to be much smaller. What about printing speed then? The IBM printer is capable of printing 80 characters per second. The typewriter? 12. That's 15% of the IBM speed. And speed was a big selling point back then. This Oki Data ad comparing a Microline 92 to the IBM 5152 is mostly bragging about the speed being double of that of the IBM. Which brings us to another problem with the typewriter over printers like these. Both the Microline 92 and the IBM 5152 are graphics-capable printers. The pins can be individually addressed to create per-pixel images. The typewriter is limited to the characters on the daisy wheel only. However, that is also a benefit. There was a term now long forgotten to describe the image from something like this typewriter. Letter quality print. The dot matrix printers can't come close to competing with the daisy wheel and the typewriter when it comes to the quality of printed text. The pins in the head just can't recreate the fine details up close, where the typewriter does so without even trying. And the typewriter can even change its typeset by just replacing the wheel. Low resolution dot matrix printers were very limited for font types. But the typewriter doesn't get to hold on to that last advantage. Printers were available with the daisy wheel as well. Matter of fact, daisy wheels were in printers first, or at least terminals. Which leads us to the final problem, cost. The complex electronic nature of the typewriter meant that it wasn't cheap. And in 1985, when that article was written, the Ultrasonic 350 was $569. Now, the IBM 5152 started out at about $700 when it was launched in 1981, but it looks like it may have been down to $449 by 85. The Microline 92 was available for either $395 or $449, depending on the model. In the Daisy Wheel printer I showed, it's a bit harder to find, but it may have been as low as $270. Lacking graphics functionality really helped its cost. And finally, it gets even worse for the typewriter. The messenger module was not included with it and was an additional $170 option, meaning the total price to use it as a printer was $739, which is more expensive than buying either of the dot matrix printers and the daisy wheel printer. So, the typewriter was larger, slower, lacked graphics, and more expensive. It's no wonder these weren't common. While there were some less expensive options available than this Ultrasonic 350, because really this is a fancy typewriter, all the other problems still existed for essentially all typewriter printers. But as a collector 30 years on, none of these drawbacks bother me. If anything, the limitations present themselves as a unique charm. So I'm very happy to have added this to my collection. And since it's just a plain text parallel printer, there's no reason it can't be used with modern computers. 
I was hoping to demo this, but while trying to get that one last thing set up, it ran out of ribbon. So perhaps we'll take a look at that later. For now, that's pretty much everything I wanted to cover. If you want to support the channel, I am on Patreon. But for now, I hope you enjoyed that, and I'll see you next time.